It's time to return to another childhood classic, or rather a classic from my teenage years, because I never outgrew kids' movies, and when I heard that there was an entire series of Tinkerbell movies, of course I had to watch them all. And yes, one of them does touch on themes of disability. Secret of the Wings is the fourth of seven films in the Disney Fairies series, but honestly, you don't really have to watch any of the others to get this one. Sure, you might get a little lost about who Tink's friends are, and what the exact lore of why they do what they do is, but the story is still comprehensible without all of that. But in the interest of getting you all up to speed, this is the lore of Pixie Hollow. When a baby laughs for the first time, that laugh will travel out into the world, and if it makes its way into Neverland, it turns into a Never Fairy. Tiny, immortal sprites who guide the seasons on the mainland. Once there, a fairy, or a sparrow man, because Disney decided there's no such thing as a male fairy. I feel like there's a joke there. Anyway. Once a fairy has been born, they're put to a test to find their talent. Think of, like, Hogwarts houses or those groups in Divergent or any of the other cookie-cutter YA dystopias from that era. But there's more of them, and they're not based on personality, but what the fairy in question is actually good at, and what their role in keeping the seasons in balance and Pixie Hollow running will be. Tinkerbell, of course, is a tinker fairy. They don't do any of the sparkly fancy magic like making flowers bloom or water bending or manipulating light. They're essentially the engineers of Pixie Hollow. And not gonna lie, I really like that. Tinkerbell said more women in STEM. Aside from these talents, Pixie Hollow itself is divided up into four quarters, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. All seasons exist at once here, which is very Fey Realm of them. Spring, summer, and autumn all fall under the rule of Queen Clarion. It's where the warm fairies live. Winter, however, is under the rule of Lord Milori. It's where the winter fairies live, and it is forbidden for any fairy to cross the border between the realms. As a side note, the first time I heard a character say Lord Milori's name, I genuinely thought his name was Lord Milord. In the beginning of Secret of the Wings, all we really know about winter is that it's cold, and the warm fairies are forbidden from going there because they don't handle the cold well. Tinkerbell, of course, is incredibly curious and wants to go explore this side of her world that she's never been allowed in before. So she follows her friend Fawn, helping her to guide some of the animals from autumn into winter, and when Fawn isn't looking, she takes her chance and crosses the border. To her understandable shock, her wings begin to glow soon after. The movie calls it sparkling, but I'm going to stick with glowing because that's what they actually do. As soon as Fawn realizes Tink has crossed the border, she lessos her back to safety and rushes her to the healers, and this is where we learn why crossing the border is forbidden. In the cold of winter, a warm fairy's wings will freeze and crack, while in warmer weather, a winter fairy's wings will wilt and eventually break as well, and there is no cure for a broken wing. This is stated very clearly in the beginning of the movie. Keep that in mind. This, as we find out later, is not a rule set in place by Lord Milori, as Tinkerbell initially assumes. It was first decreed by Queen Clarion, and Lord Milori agreed that it was what was best for their people. But of course, Tinkerbell is not deterred in the slightest. Mostly because when she tries to find out why her wings started glowing out of nowhere, the copy of the book on wings she tries to do her research with has sustained damage to the most vital pages courtesy of the bookworms. 
and turns out the author is a winter fairy. His name is Dewey, but I'm going to call him Fairy Einstein because, I mean, come on. Oh, I've written about the sparkling, but the, I've never seen the sparkling with my own papers. <laughs> oh, uh, follow me. Turns out the reason her wings started to glow is because she is something singularly rare among fairies. So rare, in fact, that while Fairy Einstein has written about it, he's never actually seen it in person before. Tinkerbell is a twin. One of two fairies born of the same loft. Her sister, Periwinkle, got caught in some branches as they were flying on the wind to Neverland, and while Tink ended up at the home tree, Perry's root got shifted to winter. Their wings glow when they get close to one another, and then seem to chill after they've spent some time together. This, of course, only makes Tink more determined to have the rule about not crossing the border abolished, and while she thinks if she just explains things to Queen Clarion, she'll remove the rule, as I said before, it was originally her idea, so that's a non-starter. Especially considering how deeply emotionally driven that decision was for her. See, the reason why she made this decree in the first place was out of guilt. When she was young, she met and fell in love with a winter fairy, and he fell in love with her. But they weren't careful enough and he ended up breaking a wing. So her solution was to put in place a rule that would hopefully stop that from ever happening again. It's not the best move, but from an emotional perspective I can see where she's coming from. That winter fairy, by the way, is Lord Millori. He's missing half of one of his wings. In form of transportation, he either walks or rides on the back of a snowy owl. One of the most surprising things about this movie is how unremarkable this is. Despite being the inciting incident for the rule that creates most of the conflict, his actual disability is handled remarkably well. He's still a capable leader, his people respect him, and he cares deeply for them. The lack of proper communication between him and Clarion is based entirely on her guilt, not any sense of anger or hurt from him. It would have been so easy for the writers to make his disability a source of mistrust towards the warm fairies, but the movie flat out refused to go there. He honestly doesn't seem overly distressed about his broken wing. He's getting on fine, he has his systems in place for how he functions in this very vertical world, with no independent vertical movement of his own. From how I read it, his motivation seems to center more on Clarion than himself. He has learned to live with his disability. He's honestly fine with it at this point. Clarion's the one who still feels guilty, whose guilt initially spurred her to act, and he clearly didn't know how to make her feel better without agreeing to a plan that would hopefully stop anyone from hurting like she's hurting ever again. His motivation throughout this entire movie is honestly just to keep everyone safe. And that's another thing I appreciate about it, this movie has no real villain. The moment he has the chance, he's back at her side before you can say, I called it. On the one hand, this could be seen as a negative, as most of the perspective on his disability comes from external sources from him. But on the other hand, it's also pretty realistic. It's not unusual for a disabled person, especially someone who's been disabled for a while, to just exist with their disability. Humans are amazingly capable of learning how to handle our own bodies, even after we've gone through traumatic injuries. Friends and family, however, that can be an entirely different story. Especially when there's an accident involved. 
Clarion and Milori reconnecting as the rule is abolished at the end of the movie is much more about Clarion learning to forgive herself and Milori waiting with open arms to welcome her back. Now, this is not something all disabled people would want to do with someone who they were once close to but has pushed them away out of guilt, but it's not something no disabled person would want to do. And at the end of the day, it's just the story of a couple who had really bad communication issues for a couple hundred years and then managed to sort it out eventually because of a crisis. And we've seen those many a time, and I don't mind them. <laughs> And yes, the rule is abolished in the end. Of course it is, it's a Disney movie. <laughs> the fairies learn that covering the wings of a warm fairy in a layer of frost will keep them safe while in winter, and the end of the movie features all the characters having fun in a winter wonderland. But I do also have to talk about the... other thing. The climax of the movie involves the seasons getting thrown out of balance and a freeze threatening the home tree. Tinkerbell, realizing that the frost fairies could help by covering the tree in frost before the freeze hits, decides to make the flight all the way from summer to her sister in the heart of winter. A flight during which the cold cracks her wing. She decides, in typical we've got other shit to deal with hero fashion, to hide this until she can't anymore. Her friends and allies all react in suitably shocked and saddened ways, because while disability isn't inherently a tragedy, traumatic injuries are called traumatic injuries for a reason, and breaking a wing, as a member of a winged species, definitely would be one. But she's Tinkerbell. She's Disney's most recognizable fairy character. We can't change her design. So we only get about a minute to consider what this might mean, how she's going to adapt, before... Jingles! I guess having a twin in this universe means your wings can just magically heal. Which is also why people think there's no way to cure a broken wing, because for the vast majority of fairies, there isn't. This is why today's video's been a hybrid of my usual review style and a speed paint, because I was too fascinated by the idea of how one might design a disabled Tinkerbell, to fit with the Pixie Hollow Tinker Fairy aesthetic to leave it alone. On a certain level, I understand that massive companies do not want to redesign their signature characters. On another, I am massively disappointed because this is a complete cop-out. It was set up a little bit that Tink and Perry's wings had some kind of reaction to each other when they touched early on, but, on the whole, it comes out of nowhere and serves only to kill any future potential this plot point brought up. In all honesty, it feels utterly pointless. It's a problem for less than a minute and then instantly fixed and shoved under the rug. Why even have Tink break a wing if all it was going to lead to is this? Milori's disability is handled so well and he's allowed to just exist so casually that this sudden insta-heal at the end of the movie feels all the more jarring by comparison. All in all, Secret of the Wings isn't an awful movie as far as movies touching on fantasy disabilities go. In fact, it's got more points in its favor than not. It just decided to pull some completely unnecessary bullshit right at the end for reasons I still can't quite fathom. And I've had like 10 years to try and figure it out. Oh good lord, this movie came out 10 years ago. Alright, before I go sit down to confront my own mortality, let me just say thank you for watching this video, and for all of the amazing support recently. We're almost at 20k subscribers now, which is absolutely wild. Again, thank you all so much. If you liked this video, consider liking it and maybe subscribing. I will be back here Thursday after next. Bye!